Hi, welcome to this video lecture on public and private rights in the coastline. When we talk about public and private rights, one of the first things we have to say is um, rights in what exactly? And in order to start talking about what those rights are, especially when we're talking about coastal rights, public and private rights in coastal areas, we have to first define what those aspects of the coastal area are, what are the coastline. This has been described in the introductory materials, but that's in a separate uh, set of materials and a separate lecture. So let's just review quickly uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about the coastline. First of all, we have the upland area, and we can define these. And these are, by the way, these are lines that we're seeing here, and we'll see some natural boundaries that we'll use to identify these lines. But one of the things that I want to point out is these are human-made delineations. So they vary. They can vary from you know coastal state to coastal state or littoral state if we're talking about Michigan, Wisconsin, anywhere around the uh, Great Lakes, for example, or any sort of body of water. But we um, it, it depends on um, a mix of federal, state, and local law. Uh, and these sort of definitions can vary. And I'll give you an example of that uh, uh, in just a moment or a few moments. But generally speaking, we can say that, you know, we can look at general characteristics and we can say, look, there's this area of land as we approach, let's call it a coastal area. So we have the ocean. Uh, there's this uh, area of land here that we can call the upland area, and then it abuts uh, some sort of vegetation, usually natural vegetation. And of course, if it's developed, if we're talking about developments that are happening, or if certainly if we're talking about sea level rise and climate change, then we can, uh, you know, if we have uh, buttressing, if we have uh, seawalls and things like that, human-made structures to prevent a, an approaching ocean um, from moving landward or inland, uh, then you know often we don't see these sort of lines of vegetation, for example, or if we do, they're they're human made. They're not naturally occurring uh, areas that that have a natural sort of uh, delineation between an upland area that's a bit higher in elevation as it starts moving down uh, to the ocean or to the seawater. Um, we'll have an abrupt sort of we'll have water meeting a you know structure we'll call it like a seawall for example and then after that seawall we just have you know development and we can see this in many coastal cities i live in massachusetts so i think of boston but you know wherever you are i think of the if you're along the promenade or many areas of coastal areas or coastal regions along Boston and the sea walk and that sort of thing. And you can you can often think of, you know, just sort of just that you have development and high rises and other buildings that are pushed right up against uh, the ocean, the, the bay, you know, Massachusetts Bay or the, uh, you know, the different areas, Dorchester Bay, just depends on what area of Boston you're in. Uh, and it moves right to that uh, water area and you don't have these sort of natural features. But for our purposes here, we can say that we have this upland area, and then it sort of starts moving into this sort of, we'll say under natural conditions, this, this line of vegetation. And we normally see these, uh, the vegetative masses, depending on which area you live in, which region you live in, um, certainly here in the United States, but also globally, but there's normally a line of vegetation. And then after that, you'll start seeing some sort of um, uh, dry sand dry sand areas and they can be dunes you can often see sand dunes for example and you might have some uh, sea grasses before the sand dunes uh, you know that mix in with this sort of sand and then this dune area and then you have the dry sand uh, that then extends to a point of a high tide line this is your average mean high tide line it varies based on a number of uh, factors, including uh, the moon phases. The moon uh, has a gravitational pull on tides. and But generally speaking, on average, there's this sort of general area where the high tide normally meets the mean high tide. And um, on a daily basis or multiple times in a day, again, depending on where you live, uh, you'll see that they, you know, there's a, a differentiation between that high tide line and then when the tide rolls out to this sort of average low tide, which again varies and has some variation depending on a number of factors and influences, but generally speaking has this sort of average daily uh, sort of low tide. 
and then you have the in between uh, the intertidal area known as the wet sand we'll just call it here but an intertidal zone and then you have what is always generally speaking submerged land uh, that then extends for some point to some uh, area or region and normally that you know in the United States, there's around three nautical miles, we'll just call it three miles approximately from that uh, region is state ownership. And then there's uh, another period of distance, uh, again, seaward, usually it's uh, 12 miles, nine additional miles, but 12 total miles, uh, usually nautical miles, is the federal territorial sea, we'll call it, where the uh, United States, certainly in other countries, uh, exert, um, you know, significant uh, domestic jurisdiction, you know, not a lot of not a lot going on here for international concerns, uh, or not a lot of things that other countries can do in terms of this area. And then there's from, you know, again, this, this starting point to about 200 nautical miles or some variation of that. And uh, we can talk about that later, but it, it might vary based on um, the sort of geomorphology of the what's going on underneath that water. You know, there's a continental shelf and a continental slope. And depending on how that works out, sometimes that can move beyond 200 nautical miles. This is mostly an international law, but it's also been codified in the United States under its national laws. Um, but anyway, that you can get up to uh, at least 200 nautical miles here is what's known as the EEZ or exclusive economic zone. And then generally speaking after that is international water. But anyway, we have this sense of this variation of these natural features. And these are human identified. I mean, look, under the natural features, they certainly are just that they're natural. Um, but um, generally speaking, um, you know, these are human delineated identification marks. We just identify these different regions and give them legal significance. And so what's important about that is that when we look at these things, this is what really defines what we call our potential coastal zone, what might be our entire coastal zone. Well, it might include up, certainly it might include the uplands, portions of the uplands, uh, all of this sort of in between vegetation, the dry sand, sorry, it's moved on me here. That's uh, the dry sand, uh, the wet sand, and then even portions of our ocean uh, can all be included as parts of a potential coastal zone. And that's important to know because as we think of these characteristics, we can say, well, Coastal zone is generally speaking related to these areas to some degree, but I understand that it varies. I understand that, you know, the coastal zone in, in coastal region, coastal state A might be X, it might be Y in some other region, it might be, you know, some variation of this. And when we look at the materials, we see that there's um, some special, you know, uh, definitions that might apply. Some states might take a scientific uh, definition. They might look at these characteristics and identify these characteristics as the means by which we identify, uh, you know, the uh, coastal zone. And uh, others might look at more legal or policy definitions, which might conform to those scientific definitions, but they might be different. Uh, they might be in addition to. And um, the question is, you know, where do these coastal zones move to? You know, often it depends. Um, Hawaii identifies effectively the entire state as the coastal zone. So there is no place effectively, I believe, in Hawaii, if I'm saying that correctly. It's just I haven't looked it up in a few years. But uh, per my recollection, um, Hawaii identifies the entire landmass of all of the islands of Hawaii as part of its coastal zone. Uh, so for Hawaii, anywhere on the islands, anywhere, even if you're up in the mountains, that's part of the coastal zone and per its own definition. Does that make sense from a sort of scientific standpoint? Probably not. But from a policy legal standpoint, that's, you know, uh, Hawaii is basically identifying itself as um, critically connected to as being an island, uh, an island state and an island nation, uh, critically connected to those uh, to the ocean and coastal resources. And in that way, it then also then triggers a number of things, both uh, within the state of Hawaii, but also maybe um, it does that also for important reasons from a, a federal standpoint. There are some federal laws, including the Coastal Zone Management Act, that might provide you know, additional benefits to Hawaii as a result of it identifying all of its landmass. Here in Massachusetts, you know, um, we have um, 
we have a strange sort of mix, uh, and I think I identify this in notes that Massachusetts uh, extends its coastal zone from the water from from this area of the ocean from the uh, low tide line there. Um, from the water until about 100 feet beyond the first major land transportation route encountered. So it's from the water to some point of upland area, um, 100 feet beyond that first uh, upland area major transportation route. That could be a road, for example, that could be uh, a rail, that could be anything, any sort of major transportation um, identification on upland areas. And so 100 feet beyond that. Um, so that's very much a legal and political definition. And by the way, that definition, there's an exception to that in Massachusetts, which is Cape Cod. The entire region of Cape Cod is like Hawaii considered the whole thing, the whole landmass is considered to be part of the coastal zone. So Massachusetts has uh, an inconsistent definition depending on where you are in Massachusetts. If you're in the coastal area outside of Cape Cod, then it's the 100 feet beyond that major sort of transportation route. If you're on the Cape, then it's the entire Cape that's covered. So every state has these unique uh, definitions. And why does it matter? Why do these definitions matter? They matter because when we're talking about public and private rights within the coastal zone, we certainly need to know, first of all, what is that coastal zone? So uh, these rights that we're going to talk about, um, they how are they defined and where do they exist within that coastal zone? In terms of the big picture, there's really two components that we can look at. We can look at these rights and ask questions like, what are they and what do they relate to? Who has them? And are they conditional? And as far as the coast specifically, so these rights and these three sub questions relating to rights in general, right? What are they? Who has them? And are they conditional? And then in relationship to what? What is the coast? How is it defined, right? Is it natural, political, et cetera? Is it consistent between jurisdictions, right? And we've already identified, I've already mentioned that it's not, generally speaking. There's a lot of shared space. If we think of the Venn diagram sort of uh, uh, analogy, maybe, or metaphor, you know, there's a lot of shared space between coastal states on what they would identify as a coastal region. Um, many of those characteristics are the same, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of space um, that isn't shared between different coastal states, for example. So is it consistent between jurisdictions? And at the state level, the answer is no. Is it more consistent at the federal level? Does the federal uh, government look at coastal areas and under a defined definition? And is it consistently applied amongst all of the different states, et cetera? So that tells us, uh, we can start thinking of that question um, from a policy standpoint, right? Because it matters because how these regions are defined and what the coast is considered and defined as really tells us a story about, well, what are those rights? And then how are those rights applied? And then what are the implications based on these varying definitions? And then is it specific? Is it sort of, you know, again, that scientific latitude and longitude, right? Is the coastline, can it be uh, equally applied? And is it specific between very specific natural features? Or is it something that is subject to change? Now, change is an important point to make here, because again, if we think of something like climate change and sea level rise, the question of change comes to mind, because if our seawater, if our oceans are, are, are rising, and if that's causing incremental increases landward, so our oceans are moving slowly, and you can think, you know, in places where there's a lot of run with very little rise, so in low-lying areas, and, you know, Again, in, in, in Massachusetts, uh, other states are like this, but again, I can use Massachusetts a lot because I live here and I do a lot of studying and work here. Massachusetts, as particularly uh, when we think of the coastal regions, for the most part, particularly as we go move into southeastern Massachusetts and around the Cape, it's low-lying in southern New England as well. They're very low-lying areas. There's what's they're what considered mostly uh, glacial till, the sort of leftover remnants of the cobble and other sort of uh, particulates, uh, boulders, et cetera, as the glaciers had moved 
from the Arctic moved from northern latitudes down. And then after that interglacial period sort of retreated, the stuff that was left there. So, you know, uh, created this sort of very low lying landmass. So the point is when it's low lying and it's not very hilly and it's not, um, you know, sort of the cliffs or bluffs that we might see in other areas, I think of the uh, the, the Dover uh, in England, the large cliffs that you might see where, you know, the sea is uh, very proximate to the land, but, you know, the land mass is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet or meters uh, above, you know, you think, well, sea level rise doesn't have much of an impact because even if it rises by feet, it's still well below, it's not going to move landward in those areas, but in very low lying areas, you might get for every inch or two of sea level rise, you could get feet even uh, multiple dozens of feet and even you know meters or feet uh, landward push of the water. And the question is, if I'm a coastal uh, private property owner along the coastline, let's say, and I own the land, but not necessarily the water, let's say that's publicly owned, let's just, uh, because this is generally the rule, uh, is that, you know, submerged land is publicly owned land, it's owned by the government or the people, right, and held in trust by the government for the benefit of the public, the people. But the private land, you know, the sort of the dry land, and there's some debate on where that dry land is, is it, you know, is it the high tide mark, right, or is it where the water low tide, you know, is it where the land is dry some of the time, or only where the land is dry all of the time. But the point is, let's just say there's this dry land that's dry all of the time, it's the mean high water mark. Uh, that I showed you, I can go back quickly, this I actually can't go back so quickly as yes, I can if I go here. Um, so you think of the dry sand, for example, if, if, if private property ownership begins at that dry sand and the ocean moves landward uh, because of sea level rise, who owns that? If it moves from the latitude, if it now covers portions of that dry sand and even continues to move towards the vegetation line, let's say, and even moves into the upland area of what is what has been private property, uh, the house that you see there on the upland uh, portion. If it does all of that, if it continues to move in that direction, does that mean that that private landowner has lost property? Does it mean that they now have, you know, that 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 ocean moving landward is removing? It's relatively speaking. Now, this is again an argument that can be made. We can call it a natural phenomenon, relatively speaking, as far as nobody's sort of digging out uh, the sort of the the making the wet sand or the dry sand or the vegetation line or the upland, right? Nobody's digging a hole to allow the ocean, right? Reducing the uh, the elevation to allow the ocean to start moving in and filling in that hole. Uh, rather, it's sea level rise. But of course, we know that humans are the major contributor to sea level rise um, by the fact that we're taking hydrocarbons, basically carbon, and removing it from deep buried sources in the earth and moving it into the atmosphere. And as a result of that, increasing, you know, the heat retention and then therefore increasing both the amount of melt of ice and also thermal expansion and some other phenomenon of water. The point is we're making, we're putting more water volume into our oceans and that volume is, you know, pushing. So there's an argument to be made that, well, it's not really natural. I mean, it is a result of certain activities, human activities, um, but maybe human activities are part of natural activities, just like a beaver, uh, you know, uh, creating dams, you know, that sort of thing, and then damming up an area and, and so on and so forth and the effects of that. Uh, so maybe, you know, human activities could be considered quote unquote natural, or maybe they're not. The point is, again, these are legal, so we're moving outside of the natural and moving into more legal, you know, human-based uh, decisions and uh, judgments. And so, but the, the, the fascinating question is, when that process occurs, are we talking about something that is, you know, moving from public, let's say, you know, like I said, submerged lands are generally public lands, right? So is that private property owner losing land mass, you know, and so are we changing, and we're not necessarily changing the definition of the coastal zone, but the rights to those private rights, 
Are they degraded? Are you losing actual area and land? And can you literally you lose your entire landmass? If there's enough sea level rise, let's say, enough approach of the ocean, can you lose your entire what used to be your, you know, the, the boundaries of your property, the latitude and longitude exact geolocation of your property? Can you simply lose it? So that's a fascinating question. We'll run right through these again. So that's the big picture is there's two components. There's rights, and we can ask questions about the rights, and then the coast. What is the coast? How is it defined? So on and so forth. So let's keep that in mind. As far as rights are concerned, there are two things that we can look at, or two areas. There are the private rights, which are what we just talked about, like rights of ownership, et cetera. And then there are the public rights, which are more not necessarily, there certainly is ownership. Like I said, submerged lands, for example, in ocean waters, right? Um, there is an ownership. We all have a, a collective, uh, the public has a collective vested ownership uh, in submerged lands and whatever resources we find in those submerged lands and that's you know you think of offshore drilling for example so the oil you know the uh hydrocarbons the petroleum etc that's a resource um the natural gas as well all of that um, but also the fish for example we have commercial fish species target fish species um obviously the everything you think about in terms of um, offshore use or water use, and that includes water dependent uses, boating, sailing, um, kayaking, um, uh, swimming, just the basic recreations of tourism and just, you know, going onto the beach uh, the, and then accessing the water for all of the types of things that humans like to do. So we can think of those property rights, but also we think mostly of rights of access because while most of us you know, engage in activities or like, you know, not most of us, some of us engage in activities that are water dependent activities, ocean dependent. Um, many of us um, don't, we're not actively using those resources. And then when we do, it's also just time dependent. If you're a commercial fisher, it's different, you know, if you, that's part of your job and your livelihood. But if you're a tourist and you like to go to the beach or a couple of times a year and you like to engage in just, you know, accessing the water for a variety of purposes, limited purposes, swimming around, surfing, body surfing, whatever it might be, scuba diving, um, you know, snorkeling all those things. They're not something that you would do, um, you know, on a regular basis all the time, right? So it's really about accessing that resource for limited uses. So we can dif differentiate between these private rights and these public rights, right? So that's generally speaking categorically, private rights versus public rights in coastal areas. And then the question is, but rights in what? What are we talking about in terms of rights? So Here's our little sort of setup again of our generalized coastal area. Now, most of the time, for the in terms of private rights, you see this red identification. This red identification is meant to refer to sort of a, a boundary of where most coastal states identify private property rights. So in other words, if I'm a private coastal landowner and I have a house in that upland area, I own if I do, in fact, own, right, this isn't necessarily, but I can own all the land all the way to the um, basically dry sand, the, the difference between the high tide line, the mean high tide line. That's generally what I own. And for many, many states, coastal states in the United States, that's the case. That's my private rights, the extent of it. Whatever my rights are in that private land, you know, the right to exclude, this is property law, right? When the bundle, we call it a bundle of sticks. In other words, that when you buy or purchase real property, you're doing this and you're, you know, you're spending money and time because it provides you with a number of rights that you normally don't have in that specific. And one of the most in, in that specific area, that particular latitude and longitude, you know, meets and bounds and that sort of thing, the description of that private property. I own three acres located at so-and-so and so on and so forth, described in this so on and so forth way. And that's, you know, when you purchase the land, that's what you're purchasing. And you're purchasing a number of rights and, you know, you can't do everything and you can't do anything. And we know this, right? So it's not a matter of I can do anything and everything that I'd ever want to do. I can, I can, you know, have dangerous chemicals on the land, I can, you know, I can shoot, I can do very dangerous things on the land, I can, you know, do all kinds of whatever it is that I want to do, uh, you know, there are limitations, but there's a number of things that you can do. One of the most important things of those bundle of rights, one of those most important sticks is the right to exclude. That's one of the reasons we have private property. It's to exclude other people 
from accessing your property. That's what makes it private. In many people's eyes, that's the idea is that I can go there, but I can prevent other people from going there. And if you think about it, that's the fundamental nature of what it means to have private property. I think it's the most important right. And many people do. Uh, and, and, you know, so anyway, if we think of that private versus public right, those rights, of course, but for the private, for most coastal states, when we're talking about the coastal area, it's really the upland to that sort of high tide line, the mean high tide line. In some coastal states, not many, but Massachusetts is included, Maine as well, but um, and a few others, um, it, the blue hash mark represents the extent of the private right. For um, you know, and this is kind of interesting, and I'll explain why it's interesting in a moment, but if so for places like Massachusetts or some coastal states, the private right extends all the way to the low mean tide line. So I own not only the upland, the vegetation, the dry sand, but I also own that land that, you know, that reference land all the way down to where the water is at low tide, to where it touches the water at low tide. Now, why does this matter? Uh, the difference between the two? Well, imagine, think of this, right? Think of this difference. If I'm living, if I'm a coastal landowner in Massachusetts, right, and I talk about that very important right, the right to exclude others, that right to exclude extends all the way to where the ocean is. It certainly does at high tide, as it does for other coastal states where the private landowner owns up to the mean high tide line. But in places like Massachusetts, it also extends to the low tide line. Now, this is important because imagine if you're in this state, the red line state, coastal state, and it's low tide, this is public property. So that means that somebody who's coming along, walking along for, let's say, an intended purpose, and let's say those purposes are specifically delineated, but the point is they're walking on, this is public property. And so it's no problem for them to hang out here for three, four, five, six hours, depending on the tide, right? Uh, to just hang out here because it's public land. So Look, if I buy this property and I'm in this red section, right? And I, the whole intent of my property was for my property to touch the water and then to be able to exclude others from use. It's kind of hard for me to be in this situation where I'm in the red scenario, the red coastal state scenario, because I don't own this. I have no ownership, right? And there's either, there's actually specific public ownership of this wet sand area, the intertidal zone. And so I can have people hanging out between my property and where I touch the water in this area during low tide. Whereas if I'm in Massachusetts, I don't, I can put up a fence, let's say, for example, you know, a fence that excludes people from accessing all the way down to the bottom of the water if I live in Massachusetts. Now, why does that matter? If the area above mean high tide line is considered private, and Massachusetts and other states have that exceptions, right? The public has rights in these areas, including traditional rights. So fishing, fouling, and navigation. So one of the reasons this matters is because if I'm in this area, if I'm one of the red, if I'm in the red and I'm in the red coastal state and I'm hanging out in this area, then I have the right to be there and I have the right to access and walk over this land and use this land for at least, these are traditional old, now this goes back to where do we get these rights and this ideas from, you have to understand, and this is in the materials, um, we inherit many of our sort of common law traditions uh, from merry old England. It's also elsewhere because actually England inherited, at least in terms of maritime, in terms of these coastal rights and ocean waters, inherited much of its legal tradition from Roman, when Rome occupied, you know, England. Uh, and so from Roman law. So we're, we're going back to traditions that extend for thousands of years of early uh, sort of doctrines of law and doctrines of maritime law and access and public rights versus private rights and access to water, so on and so forth. These are long historical traditions. And we in, in the United States have inherited many of these traditions, the common law tradition from England, um, because of our early settlements and, you know, that sort of thing in colonial, uh, the colonial era United States and then how that expanded across the country, even after we uh, declared our independence and fought for it and so on and so forth. But that's where those traditions come from. And of course, English traditions along these lines, uh, many of them come from uh, Roman law traditions. So we 
these traditional traditions, traditional tradition, these historical traditions uh, include fishing, fowling, and navigation. Fowling is bird hunting. I know it's uh, so. Think about it. So if I'm here, I'm sorry. If I'm if I'm here, then um, I can be on accessing at least for those reasons, right? And um, those rights are defined: these fishing, fowling, and navigation, and other rights. For example, New Jersey. It depends on the coastal state because they extend even further. New Jersey um, they give the right of access not only to the wet sand, actually to the dry sand, for hanging out for um, recreation. So for sunbathing and for swimming. So New Jersey, they have a, they have a significant amount of public rights that, may, that even extend into the red area of private land. So it's like when I purchase this property, I take it subject to knowing that while I'm the owner of this land, in some coastal states like New Jersey, very few, but New Jersey maybe being the most extreme example of this, um, where I even understand that I'm, I have sort of a, I'm giving an allowance, even though I own the property, my right to exclude on the dry sand in New Jersey for extended reasons for the public, including hanging out if I want to go swimming and hang out and sunbathing and, you know, water dependent activities, uh, this adjacent dry sand is available to them. Think of it as kind of, under, again, under property law, kind of like an easement. So I might own the property, but inherently, as a matter of state law, I grant an easement, let's call it that, to the public to use a portion of my property, uh, the dry sand, as long as they're using it for one of these public trust doctrine purposes as defined by New Jersey law and accepted in New Jersey law. Um, and New Jersey, again, goes pretty far. But even if I'm outside of New Jersey, if I'm in one of these red states, I certainly can't prevent anybody from being in this area, it's public area. And even if I'm in Massachusetts and I own this area, the wet sand, I cannot prevent people from accessing the wet sand if they're access, even if I'm the owner, if they're accessing it for at least the fishing, filing and navigation or traditional public trust doctrine purposes. So that's important to know, because what it's doing is it's telling us, look, there are private and public rights. And even when there's private ownership, those public rights might extend into the private ownership, depending on where we are. They always do. They certainly do. Now, maybe they don't extend as much for the red coastal owner outside of New Jersey that is accessing the intertidal zone for whatever purposes, because that is a public right. Um, and those public rights extend to at least fishing, fowling, and navigation, if not more boating and, and sunbathing. And, you know, just think of the things that you would do on the beach or use the beach for as a launching point to do other things. So that's important to know. Now, in terms of the public trust doctrine, there's a few things that we can say. Remember, we have our private rights, the rights of ownership, et cetera, and our public rights, the rights of access, so on and so forth. We can using these terms, these official terms, and this comes from our sort of historical Roman law. So we're gonna use a little bit of Latin here because it's legal doctrine, uh, common law. Legal doctrine often uses Latin terms, but we have our just privatum and our just publicum. These two sort of ways that the public trust doctrine looks at um, these sort of private rights and public rights and balances them. And remember the public trust doctrine is about, look, the people, own the rights to public areas and all submerged land is owned by the public. That's key. It's owned by the public. Uh, and at the very minimum, even if the, you know, the actual private right can be divested from public ownership, the inherent rights under that right of ownership cannot be divested. And I'll explain that. So there's public interest in coastal lands, like we said, at least fishing, fowling, and navigation, and they cannot be reduced under the public trust doctrine. So those interests, whether you're a Massachusetts type coastal state or you're a New Jersey or other red type coastal state, depending on wherever that private ownership is, the public interest in coastal lands, those interests cannot be reduced. You can't give away. The government could never give away those rights, those interests. So the government could never say, well, we're going to go ahead and give away, we're going to sell this property that is submerged land, and we're going to give the property rights to some private interest. 
And with that, we're also going to give or included in those bundle of rights, we're going to include uh, the right to exclude for phishing, filing, and navigation. There is the, the government could never do that. It cannot give away these fundamental public rights under the public trust doctrine. So the way to look at that maybe is that the state or the government stands as trustee over these interests. And some of these interests are divestible and some are not divestible. Like I just said, fishing, fouling and navigation and maybe some others, they cannot be divested. So the trustee could never give them away, always for the benefit of the beneficiary, which is the public at large under the public trust doctrine. So the state may separate the private interests, some of those private interests and rights, but it can never separate the public interests. Another way of saying that is the state can maybe do away with some of the just private in interests in public spaces and public coastal areas, but it can never take uh, give away any of the public interests or the just publicums in those areas, the rights of access, et cetera. So in terms of special private rights for coastal landowners, the public trust doctrine, the P PTD, prevents private coastal landowners from, um, I'm sorry, it prevents here too, um, from certain public access to the water. And it depends on the extent of the public rights. So what, it, what, what that means is private coastal landowners cannot prevent public access, even over their private property. And we've kind of explained this. But otherwise, private landowners have special rights. So what we've been talking about mostly up until this point is the public access and how that limits private ownership and private rights. So mostly private ownership, right? We use the red line and the blue lines to help define what is the extent of that private ownership? And then what are the public rights? What can be divested? What can be limited in terms of public rights from that private ownership? Can the private ownership exclude you know, public rights? And the answer is it can exclude in many ways, but it can exclude those fundamental public interests, fishing, fouling, navigation, at least, you know, other things in other coastal states, New Jersey goes even further, you know, says not only can they access the wet sand for these, it's for not only fishing, fouling, navigation, but also for water dependent uses, including sunbathing and, and just swimming in the ocean. New Jersey goes so far to say not only can they do that in the wet sand, they can also do it on the dry sand, even if you're the owner, because you've granted an implicit easement in this area by owning this land because you know that we extend the public rights to this point. We allow the public to use dry sand as a mechanism for using those water dependent uses. So New Jersey has an expansive sense of what the just publicum is, of what those public rights are. And so that should help um, sort of put this in perspective. But we've been looking at it from the standpoint of, yes, we understand what the private ownership rights are, but what are the public access rights? What are the other rights besides ownership that the public enjoys? So beyond being close to the water, when you own coastal land, are there other rights that a private landowner, private coastal landowner has? Are there any special rights like the public has? And the answer is yes. They have a right to the natural flow of the water. And what the natural flow of the water effectively means is that they have a right to touch the water and they have a right for that, that water, the ocean, not to be impeded. So for example, a neighbor, for example, could not do something, right? Do some sort of filling project or something else that would then sort of choke off and remove the, um, the upland landowner's rights. So you can imagine a scenario, for example, where some activity, some putting out a big jetty, a big sort of, uh, you know, or some filling activity, what it would do is it effectively would reduce and remove the water and push the water back right? Ocean-wise, move the water from that private landowner through no action of their own, move it, not naturally, but move it further out to sea in an unnatural way because of the activity that they're engaged in. Uh, just say to the, you know, above or below, I mean, you could say north or south, east or west, but the point is in our picture there, something above or below the landowner, some other entity is doing something that is affecting that. So, the latitude and longitude of the mean low tide mark, right? So now the mean low tide mark in that specific area has moved oceanward, but it's done in an unnatural way because of some activity. Now, effectively, that land that's now dry is um, still owned by the state, even though it's not submerged, right? Because it hasn't naturally moved. You can imagine, we talk about sea level rise, and that's kind of the standard. 
But in some areas of the world, it is possible that over time, because of natural changes, not human-made changes, but natural changes, that the, the ocean water, the mean low tide mark recedes. It moves slowly and incrementally further out to sea over time. When that happens, generally speaking, that private landowner gets that additional dry land. So if that includes an expansion of the dry sand, if it's the red areas, the red coastal states that own up to the high tide line, if it extends the high tide line more seaward, then the private landowner gets the benefit of that. It's not as if the, you know, the latitude and longitude is set forever under natural conditions. Same thing. If it, you know, if slow natural conditions cause that you think, of, uh, and I, I want to be clear on this because you're probably thinking when the heck would ever the ocean water move further out to sea, think of inlet areas, you know, you think of like where there's big sandbars, this happens down in Cape Cod in Massachusetts, where there's a lot of storm activity and because it's so low lying, you know, there's a lot of sand that's just below the waterline, you can see that sand shifts a lot and moves a lot, and it can actually and, you know, build up naturally. You think of nourishment projects where people are putting, purposely putting sand to prevent the ocean from coming in, you know, from moving in to prevent, you know, the loss of beach, for example. And that happens a lot today across the nation. You can see this if you research this or if you look into this, if you're into this um, all the time because of sea level rise. There's a lot of this sort of nourishment project. Let's put more and more sand here. Let's build up the elevation and prevent that ocean from moving landward. But there's other situations at the local level, where, you know, because of movements, natural movements of sand and because of storms and that sort of thing, where you can actually have the effect of a nourishment project that moves the ocean a bit sort of seaward. So now what happens is if it's natural and if it's slow and incremental and not something that's, you know, there are certain rules. And again, these rules vary uh, depending on the circumstances, but you can imagine that you can actually increase a bit. Uh, that uh, upland area, the wet sand and the dry sand area under natural conditions. In that case, that upland landowner owns that additional, uh, that that addition, that accretion, you know, uh, of, la of, of sand, that, uh, that slow addition uh, of land, of upland area uh, that has moved out, which is, uh, you know, good for them. And the basis for that is this right to natural flow of water um, that they are allowed to effectively touch the water and if it's under natural conditions where the water has receded, they gain that additional land to maintain that touching the water. If it's a situation where a neighbor has unnaturally prevented them uh, from touching, then they, um, not that they get that land, that's still public land when it's unnatural, but they can then, you know, go after the neighbor and to rectify the situation to allow the natural flow of ocean water so they can, they can still uh, touch the ocean, if that makes sense. So they have a right to the natural flow of water. It's complicated. I tried to explain it in a little uh, a little bit of detail, and I hope it makes it a little less complicated. They have a right of access adjacency to the water. So this is directly related to that natural flow. It's just what I talked about. So that, you know, that they touch the water, constantly touch the water. If somebody disturbs, if a human uh, or human activities disturb that touching of the water, um, then they're entitled to remedy that so that they can continue to touch the water. And like I said, if it's under natural conditions where the water recedes, storm, additional sand, then they, the landowner has the right to that additional they can actually increase. You know, I had a half of an acre of land, but we had a big storm. And then the ocean relative, the ocean, the bay water moved a bit more, you know, seaward. And there's more land, there's more sand. Now we got a bigger beach. I own more of that beach now. I actually have, you know, not an acre of land, but now I have a, you know, six tenths or uh, three quarters, I'm sorry, half of an acre of land, but six tenths or three quarters of an acre of land now as a result of, you know, the natural conditions forcing the ocean to naturally move a bit more seaward, that kind of thing. So I've extended my wet sand, I might have extended my dry sand. The point is I own more of this land now. My land uh, goes to here now. Uh, good for me under natural conditions. Unnatural conditions, no, my land doesn't go to here, but I can force those unnatural conditions to remedy to bring the ocean back to here so that I have that right of access and adjacency to the water. So beyond being the landowner of the land, whatever that land is, I have these special rights. Additions, that's what I called an accretion, right? So that's an addition where we have an addition of land as a result of it moving out. And um, 
I have the right to purchase adjacent submerged land. You know, uh, that's a, that's a situation where actually this is submerged, but I'm able to purchase from the government some of this, you know, from the state if they're willing to sell it, the just private in portion of this uh, public property. But again, I can't purchase as a private landowner the just publicum, right? Those rights would continue. So even if I purchase this land, I'm sitting here like the, you know, the landowner in New Jersey on the dry sand. I, the public can still access, they can still, you know, navigation is basically boating, right? Fishing, following, and navigation at least. So navigation, so you can take your kayak or your, you know, uh, your paddleboard or your, you know, canoe or your, whatever it is you're doing, you know, uh, your boat, your sailboat, you can take it and you can, even if I own this submerged land, you can still sail all around it and I can't stop you. Um, because that's fundamental. That's a fundamental right, even if I purchase the private portions of the public trust doctrine rights as the upland landowner. So that's important to know. And I have the right to maintain contact with the water, which is, you know, that's all access and adjacency. And I've already explained what that is. And a right to fill if allowed. So in a situation, for example, I don't know when this would happen. So, you know, like I said, if there's been a big storm, and that's caused a lot of fill, natural sand buildup here. So the sand was under the water, but it all got pushed. A lot of sand got pushed from the ocean here so that it increased the wet sand and dry sand by putting more dry. If that's frustrated, for example, if I, I don't know, there's a situation where I have a dock and the dock extends to here, for example. And then, and I'm, I'm not thinking of opened ocean, we're thinking more of a bay, for example, or a, you know, uh, some sort of an estuary or something where I'm connected to the ocean, but through a number of channels and that sort of thing. But I have a, you know, a, a pier for my, uh, my boat that goes out to here. And now as a result of that storm, you know, it's dry land all the way to here. So do I have the opportunity to sort of fill, you know, to, to sort of, um, either fill, uh, remove fill or add fill. You can have another situation where the ocean has, um, I'm sorry, I should have said it this way. That's so that's all true what I said, but uh, here's a better example because the right to fill specifically. So the storm created, uh, you know, it, what it did is it took sand from here, the wet and dry area here, and it pushed it all here. So I have now more dry land here. And now unfortunately here has turned into ocean here. So because it's removed, it's sort of carved out that storm, that naturally occurring event has carved out some of the sand here. So I've lost this portion of dry land. So under those conditions, I might have the opportunity to, even if I don't uh, use the material that's been added up here, I can bring in new material and fill here if that's allowed to recreate these sort of boundaries that I had before, at least on this side. So that's the right to fill if allowed, specifically, explicitly the right to fill. What I was talking about uh, is also true, but it's a different context. And, you know, the right to wharf out. The right to wharf out is, it sounds crazy, but it's just the right to create a, a, a dock or a pier uh, to access the ocean. So from my upland area, I'm able to, um, you know, access for boating and for other purposes. And that's an important right if you think about it. So these are a lot of rights if you think about it. And also the right to use water for commerce. And that's it goes back to you know why people want it to be water dependent. Also, go back. It goes back to a time when before we had railroads and airplanes and you know semi uh, trucks and stuff. The the major way in which we engaged in commerce was to put things on boats, and we used water and boats to move most of the goods uh, that we created in you know area A and wanted to move all the way to area B. And we were sort of very ocean dependent in our commerce. We're not anymore, but that right again still exists, which is the right for uh, to use the water for commercial purposes. So not only can I have a pier or a dock, but then I can you know have the right to use this water as a private individual for my own private commercial purposes. So I'm not limited to those public trust doctrine, fishing, following navigation. I mean, navigation is certainly, but specifically for commercial purposes, whereas others, others aren't, if I'm a, if I don't, I'm not a, a coastal landowner, I don't necessarily have a right as just a member of the public to access the water for commercial purposes, for example. So these are a lot of rights that a coastal landowner has in addition, special rights, in addition to their regular property rights. And they're important to know because when we're talking about the public and private rights, we see how connected they are, how interchangeable some of them are, how dependent or in, in, interchangeable, I should say interdependent that they are, uh, with each other, depending on the circumstances, but also that, you know, those public rights, 
um, are, 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 you know, inchoate in many ways, you know, they can't be changed, they're static, at least the rights themselves, and that those private rights um, are subject to those public rights, but there's a lot of additional rights that coastal landowners, a, a private coastal landowner has above and beyond just owning the adjacent upland coastal property. They have a lot of water dependent rights uh, that exist. So quickly, we'll talk about some application of public and private rights here. So this gets complicated and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's too much to, that we could talk about that would take way too much time. Uh, there's a lot of materials, there's a lot of additional um, uh, resources that you can tap into in order to get more details. Um, but generally speaking, the public and private rights identified are bounded by a myriad of federal, state, and local laws. So above and beyond all of that sort of the intersections I just mentioned, how they're sort of interdependent with each other in many ways. Um, you know, your public right affects my private right, my private right can impact your public right to some degree, so on and so forth, right? Um, depending on where we are in Massachusetts, my private rights extend to the low tide. In other states, they extend to the high tide. So your public rights are more are clearly delineated in the intertidal zone in places that are not like Massachusetts. They're less clearly delineated in terms of like access use when you are in Massachusetts. Um, so you see this inter, that's what I mean by interdependency. They're sort of, uh, you know, they, they, they share a lot of space with each other and they can conflict at times. Uh, not meant to conflict, but they can conflict at times. But those public and private rights identified are bounded by, in addition, to those sort of uh, common laws by a myriad of specific federal, state, and local laws. For example, while the public trust doctrine exists, the general public and private rights are subservient to other federal and state interests. So those public and private rights we just described, they are all subservient to other federal and state interests. For example, something that we will talk about in our next set of materials and uh, in a separate lecture, uh, including video lecture, the Coastal Zone Management Act, a major federal law that creates an incentive-based planning process for coastal states that can impact coastal rights of access and use, both private and public. So even though these general rules and descriptions we've just talked about are true and the public trust doctrine exists and the way that we described it as a framework is all correct, it is all dependent on additional federal and state laws. So for example, I'm a coastal state and under the Coastal Zone Management Act, I've been incentivized with money, with financial resources to create a coastal zone management plan. And so I create a plan. And by the way, almost every coastal state has, and I think Alaska might've pulled theirs, but almost every coastal state in the United States has uh, a coastal zone management plan that has been approved by the coastal zone um, uh, approved, un, uh, approved um, under the coastal zone management act by um, by NOAA basically by um, you know the organization the federal agency that's uh, delegated the uh, responsibility and authority to implement the coastal zone management act um, and as a result of most of those, almost all of those coastal states having these coastal zone, these approved coastal zone management plans, they add a lot of context to those public and private rights in coastal areas. They add limitations, they add extensions. It's, you know, so I can identify my coastal area as, you know, I'm Florida and tourism is everything for me, especially my coastal areas, because that's really what it's about. I mean, it's not everything, but it's really a lot. Um, I'm the Pacific Northwest. I'm, you know, I, what, what matters to me is certainly tourism matters. It matters everywhere, wherever there's a coastline. But, you know, maybe uh, fisheries matters a lot to me. I know Massachusetts, we have some huge fisheries here. I think in dollar terms, I know, I think New Bedford in Massachusetts uh, lands has been traditionally, historically, uh, the largest dollar value landing of any port uh, in the country. So there's, you know, there's financial interest. Uh, so coastal zones are important in some states for commercial fisheries, for example, or for research or for many, many different things. But I'm Florida and I do research, I do fisheries. We have all of those things too, but I really, really think tourism is important. And so um, I'm, I'm Texas and I think my coastal areas um, I, tourism's important, everything's important, but I also oil and gas exploration and certainly Florida too. You think about along the Gulf Coast, for example, uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, side where Texas and Florida both share and Mississippi and uh, Louisiana and so on and so forth. But 
you know, resource exploration and exploitation, uh, exploitation, um, but, you know, um, the use of natural resources, the access to natural resources uh, beyond fisheries, for example, uh, oil and gas exploration specifically, um, those might be uh, examples of um, important uh, rights that want to be highlighted by those states. And if the, and when they do, they can have an impact and an effect on public rights, not just necessarily of access, but also of use. So under the public trust doctrine, certainly we are owners, all of us are owners of those natural resources. And when a state decides to prioritize some resources, maybe at the expense of others, that can have an impact. For example, the Gulf of Mexico, it deals every year with a significant amount of hypoxia or low oxygen. And it deals with that mostly because there is a number of reasons. The Gulf, I mean, the water is getting warmer. It has other implications and it's getting warmer mainly because of climate change. But it also, because of the Mississippi and Missouri rivers and how that massive watershed in the middle of our country coming from Canada all the way from, you know, uh, from our border with Canada drains all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, there's a lot of primary productivity that occurs. There's a lot of nutrients that move into the watershed that move through those rivers down into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, that those nutrients provide a lot of primary productivity, which means a lot of production. Think of plant material, just ocean related algae and that sort of thing. And then tons and tons of things that then feed on those like not plants, but animals, little tiny animals that then feed and then respirate. And so there's huge population booms and growth. And then there's a lot of respiration. What I mean by respiration is just like you and I breathe in oxygen from the air, they breathe in oxygen from the water and then they expel you know, carbon dioxide. And so the water's oxygen levels lower significantly. Heat has a lot to do with it in terms of the, the capacity. There's a thermal effect on the capacity to hold in warm water versus colder waters. Um, there's, you know, there's a number of myriad. And then of course there's the primary productivity, but the point is the Gulf of Mexico suffers from hypoxia and that kills, it, it has huge fish kills. It creates an environment where a lot of target fish species that are important commercial fish species can't be. So you can think of the actions that some states take and if you connect dots, you can make arguments and logical arguments that look, if you if you prioritize oil and gas exploration, we think of Deep Horizon just as a clear example. Uh, 2010, the big oil spill that happened in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so if you prioritize oil and gas development, now that's federal waters versus state waters, but let's assume state waters, you know, this this gets into other problems that deal with I, federal jurisdiction versus state jurisdiction, but let's just say, look, we're a state that prioritizes oil and gas in our coastal zone areas. And then that prioritization means there's a lot of uses for oil and gas development within state waters. And then as a result of those uses, you can have problems like you can have oil spills and they have devastating ecological effects. They can affect the commercial species, the target fish species, so on and so forth. They can affect recreation. You certainly don't go down to the beach and go into the oily water, you know, the oil slicks, et cetera. Um, they can have significant problems with where commercial fish species spend early portions of their lives, they, you know, the hatcheries and the nurseries of those fish when they're small and protected in the mangroves and other areas, uh, those sort of near water, near shore uh, waters are incredibly important nursery and early life habitats. And then, so it can have an effect on a myriad of things. You think of the dominoes sort of falling in, in, in place on each other. One gets tipped, the others get knocked off and you have sort of a, an ecological cascade effect that has negative implications. So you can have, you know, the choice A results in negative impacts on, you know, on, on other important aspects of what are property rights for the public under the public trust doctrine. So we can see how the Coastal Zone Management Act, for example, when coastal states prioritize A, B, or C, how they can have an effect on those public trust doctrine rights and interest, right? And so not only does it impact, um, you know, access and use, um, but it can impact the uh, fundamental rights themselves, the actual property rights, because it can have an influence on the property. 
So understanding these basic rights set the stage for a deep exploration of federal and state laws and policies that influence these rights. So once we understand the basic tenets, we understand that there's private rights and there are public rights and that those private rights are bounded and those public rights are bounded, but they're not definitive. They're not equal everywhere. They're, they vary to some small degree. And we can see that variation. And then we can see start to be, see the interactions between those private rights the public rights, not only the property rights themselves, but the rights of access. And what does it mean to have a right of access and a right of use? And what are the sort of interactions between public and private rights? And then we can overlay government interest. And we can think of the state governments or local governments or federal governments. And they have a very uh, different uh, interest in these coastal areas and how those interests affect these fundamental framework rights, right? So we can begin with this basic framework. We can begin to say, wow, how would a, how would a, a new law or policy or an existing law or policy or a proposal affect these this sort of framework? And um, that's where we're trying to get at in terms of understanding uh, or start to thinking about an application of public and private rights. One of the ways that we can do this, try to do this quickly, so some of you might have seen this before. Some of you, this might be your first time seeing this. It's um, sort of a categorization of different types of property rights categorically. So, um, you know, we were talking about, for example, private rights, right? That the private landowner in coastal areas. So um, we can look at these categories of property rights as different types of goods or resources. Um, so we can think of private property as a type of private good homes right there, for example. What we're doing here, and so you think of, well, what fundamentally defines a private good like a home? And we talked about excludability, one of those most important property rights, right, is the right to exclude, right? But there's also something here called high divisibility. And so this makes me think about, well, let's look up here to this sort of spectrum. And we have here excludability, and we have a spectrum of low to high. So that means your ability to exclude others, right? So private property, we, one of the most important rights, the right to exclude, right? But we also have divisibility. So we have divisibility here on a spectrum, we have low to high. So we can think of private goods as, you know, homes or consume the things you buy for consumption purposes, right? You own private, your TV, your sofa, your couch, individual, right? Definable things, right? Uh, that are not divisible. They don't have, um, I'm sorry, not um, indivisible, have a high degree of divisibility. They're each one singular unit that you can separate from the other. So we can think about these private goods and you know, have here free market because free market makes us think about, well, how do we exchange and how what what is the best way to sort of deal with these these private goods right these things that share these common characteristics of high excludability and high divisibility and often we you know certainly here in the United States but in most it's pretty well been proven uh, that the sort of Adam Smith uh, invisible hand and free markets uh, you know capitalism has been a great way to sort of identify how to best distribute these types of resources you know just have a free market, People can figure out what's the right, you know, competition, the creation of these goods. It's hard to, you know, the building of these goods and then the competition in the market. And then what's the man, what's the supply, that sort of thing. So we can think about capitalism being really good at uh, distribution and dealing with these sort of private goods. We can see here that there are these other types of goods, resources, or properties, different types of property rights, right? So the opposite of a private good is something we call a public good. And public good shares the opposite, and the reason it's the opposite because it shares the opposite characteristics. It has low excludability and low divisibility. And what that means is gravity is the best example by far, right? Gravity, and I know we never think of this and we have no pricing for gravity and there's probably an important reason for that, right? No matter how much gravity I consume, right? No matter how much I consume, and I consume gravity, I guess. You can say I consume gravity because I'm here and I'm experiencing gravity. It's a force and it's a force that I experience and it keeps me tethered to this planet Earth and same as it does you and everybody else. But no matter how much gravity I quote unquote consume, right? It doesn't limit the amount of gravity available to you. And no matter how much gravity you consume, it does not limit the amount of gravity available to me. You know, a less clear example is something like national defense, right? We spend collectively, we have a collective agreement that we spend money on this common good, this public good. 
we'll call it national defense. It's a good thing because it helps protect us from the evils of the world. Um, as I'm doing this, you know, uh, Ukraine uh, is being invaded by Russia and um, their experience. And this happens. This is just one example. There's been many many types of things like going on in the world all over, but without getting into uh, uh, numerous examples, it's something that's at least in the Western conscience, we understand that uh, this is happening. It's in Europe and uh, the Western conscience is particularly, you know, focused on things that happen in the Western sphere uh, of the globe, but this happens elsewhere as well, maybe not as publicized. But the point is, Ukraine's experiencing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the implications of being invaded. And so we think of uh, national defense as a way to mitigate. NATO might be sort of a collective defense agreement where everybody pays into or contributes uh, to um, the defense of the collective. And everybody benefits from that, you know? So the Ukrainians, each Ukrainian, they're not receiving a discrete amount and they can't purchase a discrete amount of national defense, right? So they have a collective and the world is now contributing to that collective, but they have a collective uh, for national defense. And no matter how little or how much you might have contributed through taxes or whatever, that national defense applies to you equally. You receive an equal amount of that defense, depending on how it's distributed as everybody else. Um, it defends you just as much. It's not as good as an example of gravity because gravity is a pure example of a public good, but you probably can think of other things that are public goods. Uh, things that we really can't exclude people from, no matter what we do, we can't divide, divide it up, right? We can't divvy it up into small units and then sell it uh, and have it on an open market or uh, free market. Like we can't a private good. And then we have these other two other categories of things that are sort of these quasi in between a public good and a private good. We have these toll goods, which are fascinating. We think of, you know, toll goods share like a private good. They have their high, uh, high excludability but they have low divisibility. And that's things like, you know, you know, we think, we think of um, like a, I have here a private club, you know, those sort of, uh, you know, those where you pay to be a member, but membership is uh, limited, that sort of thing. Or you know, we call them toll goods because you think of like toll roads where you have to pay to use the, the thing that everybody uses equally. And toll roads might be a good example, or, you know, uh, highways where there are tolls, you know, um, where at some point you're paying into the use of the traveling on that toll for a period of time and it's equal, generally speaking, depending on a few factors. Um, parks or zoos might be another example, right? Um, but this is a situation where there's both a public interest um, because of the um, low divisibility of it, since you can't divide it, it's not really really good for a free market, not ideal for a free market, competitive sort of control, right? Um, you have this aspect of it that's a public good aspect, and that's the low divisibility, but it's highly excludable. You can, uh, you know, you can certainly over congest, right, a, a, a highway, you can, uh, you can have too many members in the club and it diminishes the value of membership because there's just, you know, it's the tragedy of the commons kind of thing that, uh, in a different way, but to move to the other, which is the perfect example of the tragedy of the commons, right? We have um, situations of what we call common pool resources. This was a term that uh, was phrased by uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, these notions of common pool resources. Uh, and she ultimately won a Nobel Prize in economics, she's not an economist, uh, for coming up with this, uh, this, this idea of this juxtaposition between these different types of uh, goods, categories of property rights or goods. Um, and, you know, uh, the common pool resource is something that has, um, it's the opposite of a toll good. It has low excludability. You can't exclude others from it. It's not like a, you know, something where you can limit membership and that sort of thing, but it has very high divisibility. And that means that each, unlike uh, the low divisibility of gravity, um, you can divide. And this is the problem where you run into sort of a lot of environmental issues. And the air and the ocean are great examples, you know, so you can think of air quality, you can think of adding to the air shed, you know, an amount of pollution that then uh, is absorbed into the air. It's or, you know, think of this, think of your sink, you fill up your sink with water and the water is drinkable, you know, because it comes from uh, a source that's already been treated and relatively speaking, either a treated or pure source of water. But once that sink has been filled up, if you start adding things, you add a drop of, I don't know, chlorine that one drop of chlorine to the amount of water that's in the sink or the bathtub, as another example, if you filled up a bathtub, it's not much, right? And it wouldn't really affect you and it wouldn't really harm you. But you know that it's now, you know, the parts per billion, parts per trillion of chlorine. It's no longer pure. 
Now it might not have a negative effect on you, um, but it's there, but it's limited, right? You add another drop and another drop and another drop, and you continue to add drops of chlorine or whatever it might be, something that's just not good for us. At some point, you know that the concentration, the parts per trillion, moves to parts per billion, moves to parts per million, parts per thousand. The point is that at some point, it gets to a concentration level where it's hazardous and dangerous. And the reason, the reason for that is because it's increasing in its concentration relative to the given unit. And if you think of it that way, you can think of how the air and ocean are um, divisible by nature, that we can divide, you know, um, the unit of clean air or the unit of clean ocean water um, in this way. We can say it's a, it's a fixed amount. There's a fixed amount of air. There's a fixed amount of ocean, just like there's a fixed amount of water in your, uh, in your bathtub or in your, in your sink. And that, you know, um, they can be divided up. We can think of this as fish, for example, fish in the ocean, right? Same thing. There's many examples of what we call, um, you know, remember the, many of you might have heard of Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons. And that was, a, you know, I think of Boston commons because that's Boston commons is a fixed area of land, you know, and it's, it's so obvious now that it's a park, um, but it has specific uses in way back when before Boston became what it is today and looked like what it does today. You know, it was an area where you could literally bring your cattle and your sheep and your others for the early settlers, relatively early settlers, and they could graze, they could graze in the commons because the commons is a fixed space and it's divisible, right? You can divide it up by square feet, square inches, acres, whatever you want to do, some unit of space, but it's fixed, it's divisible. But if you're, if it's a commons, then technically you can't, it doesn't work where, oh, you know, it's like a club, you know, a club is like uh, the first 50 people, right? The first, and then you can have the bouncer or the whoever management stop the next people from getting in and you limit it, you limit the amount. The notion behind the commons is that you can't limit anybody, everybody has equal access. So that's why it's low, it, there's no excludability or low excludability. And the tradition, uh, the traditional example of Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons is that you know, everybody comes to graze their cows and what's happening is that there's more and more farmers coming and they kind of look at each other and what farmer A who was on there early realizes, is, oh man, there's a lot of farmers coming and I see that the grass is getting eaten up. You know, it looks like the grass is going to get eaten up. And if I, if I just leave with, you know, if I just leave now with my three cows, then by the time I come back, the grass will all be gone. So you know what I better do is I better, you know, have the three cows I have, or geez, if I have two more cows, I better get them here quickly and fast so that they can feed as well, because I better use it or lose it because I know it's going to be lost. So what ends up happening is the incentive is, you know, everybody, it's a race to the bottom. Everybody then, you know, because farmer A brings two more cows or grazes his three cows for too long, which then farmer B notices and still notices there's, you know, more and more farmers coming and says, oh, my goodness, you know. So before you know what the point is, everybody overgrazes. Everybody works as fast as they can to get as much as they can as soon as they can, knowing that it's a limited resource. It's divisible. Uh, and since they know that they can't exclude others from using it, it's not private property. They can't say, you're out of here, uh, that everybody races to the bottom. And before you know it, the commons is destroyed. So this is where most environmental problems come from, is this notion of common pool resources. And why it's relevant here is because when we're talking about coastal areas, no matter what, no matter how, and we understand that there is both a scientific definition of what a coastal area is, and there's also a political policy sort of uh, legal definitions, human-based definitions that are not necessarily just purely objective, but they are bounded. And understanding that they are ultimately bounded, we know that there's limits on these areas, these coastal areas, and that many of these coastal areas share the characteristics of either a common pool resource or a public good. We know that the private area shares the characteristics of private good, but once it transitions over into the public trust doctrine, for example, we know that we're dealing with public goods and common pool resources. And we also know, for example, like fisheries, we know that everybody has an ownership. The public at large has an ownership to the fish, but we know that that's been a huge problem, that many fisheries are overfished in the United States and that we have direct government control. Effectively, that government control operates like a toll good here, right? It operates where you're trying to um, increase the excludability when we look at the whole of the system, right? 
of the fisheries and we say that man it's you know we're going to we're going to increase excludability because as a whole the fisheries uh, it's hard to define them although of course we know that we can divide the fish right um and often we what we result what we we end up doing is we end up doing uh, trading quotas or other things and uh, as a matter of trying to protect the fisheries resources which is basically we just do an auction where we give individual trading quotas this has happened here in the new england fisheries um individual trading quotas that are basically property rights private property rights we turn what is either a common pool resource right or through regulating it as a more of a total good we turn it into a private good my point is these categories of property rights are somewhat mutable in in the, in the sense that humans we can make decisions about what they are and uh, we can change some of them we can't change gravity we can never change it's low excludability and low divisibility but we can affect excludability for example we can make something that is a common pool resource that is low excludability we can make it more excludable we can make it more highly excludable if we can't change its divisibility then we can look at private goods as a way of trying to manage common pool resource problems or if we can't change its uh, divisibility, I'm sorry, if we can't change its, uh, yeah, um, if, if we, I'm going to say this wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, if it's still a common pool resource uh, problem, uh, then we can look to, um, you know, either changing its, uh, we have the divisibility uh, here, uh, where we can change uh, its excludability, but not its divisibility. And, uh, you know, often we can look at more uh, intimated government control uh, in order to change its, if we can't change its low, uh, its uh, divisibility to a lower divisibility, we can look to changing more uh, gov or engaging in more government control. The point is here, while I've sort of talked over myself because I'm, I think I'm getting a bit tired, I apologize for that, but the point here is to try and understand that many of the characteristics of these goods are immutable. Uh, so we can understand that and we can say oh look a private good and that's private property rights and that sort of thing but then we can start looking at some of the public goods and we can say is this a true public good like under the public trust doctrine some of those public uses are truly public goods but maybe some of the in between property rights and that sort of thing can look more as common pool resource problems or toll goods and we can see what we can do using this kind of framework in thinking about policy directions about how to solve some of these problems or if there is a problem define it properly and then think about some of the solutions as a final matter one of the last things that we can at least identify now is we talked about all of these different zones we identified at the very beginning all of these different zones and this is just a more sort of definitive uh, look at these zones and one thing we can identify at the very beginning is from a legal framework standpoint right we have a lot of definition if we start at private property rights and we think of free market and we think of those private goods we th we think of private property rights and whether they extend here or here you know from the upland all the way to the wet sand or dry sand the amount of legal framework definition, the amount of laws that apply, the amount of, you know, um, you know, what are those, what exactly are those private rights? What are they given, right? There's a lot of definition there. There's already a lot of law. There's a lot of policy that's enacted, right? There's a lot of, a lot of definition here. And if there is a lot of legal framework definition here, and we start moving seaward, we can understand that the legal framework definition begins to decrease. So the amount of law that applies, the very the, um, the the different kind of laws that might interact with each other, they start getting more limited as we move out here. It's a lot clearer as to the legal framework definition. There's less of them. You know, think of international law, for example, that applies mostly here. A lot less legal interactions, no federal, state, and locals, mostly national and international only uh, here. And what we can do is we can say from a policy standpoint, the amount of options that we have to change things, to alter things, to think about the, to go back here for a second, to think about how we can maybe alter the existing set of expectations with policy options and choices. Our degree of freedom, it gets less and less. We have the greatest amount of freedom, probably, 
to engage in new policy proposals and directions when we're talking about international waters. And we have less and less freedom as we move towards the upland area, towards our coastline. So that's important to know because when we're talking about private and public rights in the coastal areas, we know we're talking about a lot of laws, a lot of legal frameworks that already apply, whether that's you know common law traditions, public trust doctrine, private property rights, public uses, local, state, and national federal coastal zone management act, all of these different things that happen here. There's a lot of law, a lot of legal definition, and therefore many of the policy options are limited because they're already fixed in many ways. But as we start moving further and further away, the amount of policy option increases because the legal framework definition decreases. And that's important to know. So that's it. It's a long one, but I think it's an important one. We should now have a much better understanding of the fundamental frameworks of public and private rights in coastal areas. And now we can start to move from that foundation into more nuance, and we'll begin that with the Coastal Zone Management Act. Uh, thank you very much.